Welcome to the April General Meeting of the Oregon Mycological Society. OMS is an educational and scientific organization. Its mission is to study, collect, and identify fungi to educate members and the public in fungi identification and to promote health and safety in the gathering and consumption of fungi. Monthly meetings are part of our activities because of COVID-19, all our face-to-face -face events are on hold. This is our first attempt to hold a virtual meeting, so please have patience. <laughs> you can find out more about the Society and view other virtual content we will be creating at our website, wildmushrooms.org. Tonight's guest speaker is Michael Bradshaw. He is a PhD candidate from the University of Washington. His presentation is about powdery mildew. So without any more ado, we will transition in here and welcome Michael. So take it away, Michael. All right, Candice, thank you so much for the introduction. I'm really excited that I'm able to present to you guys online. I'm, I'm disappointed that we couldn't do this in person, but I'm glad that we're all staying healthy. Um, my talk today is titled An Introduction to the Powdery Mildews and Their Relevance in the Pacific Northwest. We'll do. Um, after that, I'm going to talk about the biodiversity and phylogeny of powdery mildews in the Pacific Northwest. And last, I'm going to talk a little bit about my research. And please, everyone involved, uh, ask questions. I don't want to be like I'm talking to my computer screen the whole time. Uh, but I'm actually going to turn off my video now. So that it works a little bit smoother. We didn't ever actually get you on screen. Okay. <laughs> there you are. Perfect. All right, so I think we should be all good right now. This is our first digital presentation for the OMS, so we're just working out a little bit of the kinks, but I think that we should be ready to go. So I graduated in 2012 from the University of Delaware with a Bachelor of Science in Agriculture and Natural Resources. Hold on. Yeah, so what you guys might not know about uh, the Delaware area is that it has a lot of beautiful gardens. Um, and this is where I really became a plant addict. I don't know if there's a lot of other plant addicts out there, but I am definitely guilty. Um, immediately after my degree at the University of Delaware, I worked at multiple public gardens throughout the United States. I first worked at Filoli. It's a public garden south of San Francisco. Um, after I worked at Filoli, I worked at Winterthur Gardens. Uh, this is a, a really beautiful estate owned by the DuPonts, and I worked in the natural lands. It was 1,600 acres. And I worked in the uh, natural forests, prairie lands, uh, and meadows. And then immediately after that, I worked at um, a nursery in the Netherlands. That's where I really learned about uh, the business side of the plant world. So after working in these public gardens for a little bit, I decided that I wanted to go back to graduate school. And I um, started my Master of Science degree in 2013, and I completed in 2016. And for my master's, I studied organic fungicides for the control of powdery mildew on chrysanthemum exmorifolium. And this is where I really fell in love with fungi and um, powdery mildew especially. Uh, for my PhD dissertation, I wanted to continue my study of the powdery mildews. And my dissertation is titled Epidemiology and Biology of Powdery Mildews and Their Host Plants. Um, currently, I'm the Integrated Pest Management Coordinator at the University of Washington main campus. I work with all the gardeners and just want to give them a little shout out before I go any further. They're all still working hard, keeping the campus beautiful. You know, we can't all go back to campus and have the lawns be uh, five, foot, five feet tall. 
So now let's get to the good stuff. What is powdery mildew exactly? Powdery mildew it gets its name from, uh, as you can see, it looks like powder on the leaf. This is just a mass of mycelium. Okay, I see the audio is great. We're working. Um, it's an obligate fungal pathogen. That means that it needs a living host to survive. And as you can imagine, it wouldn't be evolutionary advantageous to kill your host. Uh, it affects over 10,000 species of plants. It only affects angiosperms, that's flowering plants. Uh, and there's a lot of it in the Pacific Northwest. So there's a thousand species in the world and the over 150 are located in the Pacific Northwest. Our climate is actually perfect for it in that it likes these moist uh, springs for germination and then it likes dry summers for the spread of the fungus. Uh, also, there's millions of dollars are spent annually to control this fungus. Uh, this is mostly uh, um, in California in the wine industry and also in the hops industry in Washington. So why did I choose to study powdery mildew? I get this question all the time. It's actually uh, one of the main reasons is how common it is in the Pacific Northwest. I always talk about how there's, I don't know if you guys have heard about this before, but there's something called plant blindness. And that's that people aren't really able to notice plants in their environment because they're not aware of all the different species and they're not very knowledgeable about it. Um, but there's a really serious problem right now and that's powdery mildew blindness. And that, that's people don't know about powdery mildew, so they don't really notice it in the environment. And after my presentation, I'm hoping that I'm gonna cure powdery mildew blindness. When you guys are walking down the street, I'm sure you're going to notice powdery mildew everywhere. Um, it's one of the most prevalent plant pathogens in the Pacific Northwest. As I mentioned earlier, there's over 150 different species. And there's been very limited research on all these different species in the Pacific Northwest. Most people just clump powdery mildew into one species. They just, to the untrained person, it all looks the same under the naked eye. Um, but Actually, out of the microscope, there's so many differences, and I'm going to go over a lot of them today. Yeah, I know. Gary Oaks get powdery mildew every year. It's covered. It's a beautiful thing. So before I go into um, in depth about powdery mildews, I want to just take us to show you. I just want to show you guys where we are in the fungal kingdom. Basically, I want to show you guys that I know that you guys are all mushroom hunters and that me studying powdery mildew isn't so different from uh, some of the fungi that you guys, um, yes, it loves cannabis. It's one, of, it's one of the main crops that it hits, cannabis, wine, and beer. Um, so powdery mildew is in the Ashkomycota. So just looking at this tree here, before I go any further, I just want to describe what we're looking at a little bit. These are all different specimens or taxa, and it shows the evolutionary relationship between all these different taxa. Now, if you look at the bottom of the tree, um, those are going to be the most ancestral species. And then on the top of the tree is going to be the most diverged species. So most of the fungi that you guys hunt are in the Ascomycota and the Basidiomycota. Powdery mildew is also in the Ascomycota. Now, a little bit of information about the Ascomycota. On the right, you can see the um, ascus of powdery mildew. This is how powdery mildew gets its name. Um, they're commonly known as the sac fungi or the Ascomycetes. Uh, they have their sexual spores in a sac. And this sac is called an ascus. So over on the right, you can see these sacs with the sexual spores inside the sacs. So the ascomycota and basidiomycota comprise over 95% of known fungi. Right now, I, I believe that our best estimates are there are around 2 million different species of fungi, and only around 150,000 of them are currently named. 
So there's a lot of work that uh, my, us mycologists still have to do. All right, so now I wanna give you guys uh, a little eye candy, some morels. I know that you guys all love morels and morels are actually more closely related to powdery mildew than they are to some of the other uh, mushrooms that you guys collect, such as boletes. So if you look on the right of the screen here, yeah. we have morels that are in sacs, otherwise known as acai. So you have, I mean, you have these uh, ascospores within the acai. Um, I, my one story about morels is that when I started at the University of Washington, uh, I didn't really know many people around. Um, and I was just uh, starting to get, gain an interest in mycology. And there was one, of the, one student who was talking about how excited he was because he was going morel hunting over the weekend. And I had never been mushroom hunting. Um, and I asked him, I was like, can I go uh, morel hunting with you? And he told me something that I'm sure that you guys have all said before that he said, no, sorry, I don't share my spots. <laughs> but luckily, um, I have found my own locations of morels. And so when people ask me, sorry, uh, I say, sorry, I don't share my spots. So White Knight asked if anyone has any location ideas for morels that uh, they should provide contact info for anyone interested. And sorry, White Knight, but uh, I, don't, I don't share my spots. Um, so someone asked, is powdery mildew poisonous to humans and animals? And actually it is not. We all eat millions of spores all the time. It's very difficult to control for powdery mildew. And if you guys are sitting back and enjoying a glass of wine or a beer right now, I'm sure you're ingesting thousands of spores. So the next um, organism I'd like to talk about are truffles. Uh, truffles are also in the ascomycota. You can see in the center, we have the ascus with the four asco spores. Um, truffles are somewhat unique in that they have their sexual structure under the ground. Um, and this is a, can be advantageous in that one, it's a protection for their sexual spores. And they also have a very pungent smell. And this allows for animals to disperse all their different, um, to disperse their spores. Truffles. Uh, tend to have a symbiotic symbiotic relationship with different um, trees. I'm pretty sure that they have a relationship with the Oregon white oak. And a lot of times they have pigs that smell for truffles. My thing is that I really love truffles, but they give me a little bit of a stomach ache. But that doesn't stop me so much. So now that we're done with uh, morels and uh, truffles, let's get back to the good stuff, the powdery mildews. So here we have another phylogenetic tree of the powdery mildews. This is the most current evolutionary relationship between all the different genera of the powdery mildews. Uh, this was part of one of my objectives in my dissertation. We have 18 different genera in five different tribes. The powdery mildews, if you look at the root of the tree, the lower left, the purple mark, that is when the powdery mildews evolved. They believe it evolved around um, between 120 and 80 million years ago. It evolved at the same time that angiosperms flowering plants evolved because they have this uh, co-evolutionary relationship. It's never been found on any conifers or gymnosperms. Uh, it also hasn't been found on mosses or ferns. A lot of the gardeners I work with, they are um, always hunting powdery mildew for me. They always help me collect. They've been great. But a big mistake I, I made was that I told them that uh, powdery mildew 
doesn't grow on gymnast firms. And I was like, please, if you ever see it on a conifer, you have to bring it to me. It would be a great paper that I'd be able to publish. So I would say every once in a while on my desk, I get a, uh, a leaf of a conifer that has powdered sugar on it, but they can't trick me. I, I never fall for it. All right, so let's go over the powdery mildew life cycle real quickly. Um, if you look on the upper right, we have the asexual stage. Most fungi have an asexual and sexual stage. And then on the bottom left, we have the sexual stage. Powdery mildew has a very clear asexual and sexual stage, and it converts on the same leaf in the same location. So back in the upper right, we have conidia, which are asexual spores. And those will land on the plant and the plant will send out some um, chemicals that the powdery mildew will be able to recognize and it'll tell it to germinate. The powdery mildew will germinate and it'll form these hostoria, which are like these mouths that allow them to eat the plant. Man, White Knight says powdery mildew is just not very exciting to me. That's okay. We all have our uh, interests. I think that if you get to know powdery mildew a little bit better, you'll fall in love just like me. Wait until we get to the sexual, um, and then we'll get this mass of mycelium. That's when we see the powdery the, with your naked eye. That's the vegetative stage of the fungus. And from that, we'll get these conidia pores, which are these chain of spores. And these chains of spores um, are spread by wind. And then we also have the sexual structures on the lower left. These are the chasmothecium. Uh, these hold the spores that can be dispersed in the winter time. I mean, these hold the spores so that they can be protected throughout the winter. And they'll open up in the spring and they'll disperse their spores in the spring and then the whole cycle will happen again. Powdery mildew is a polycyclic disease. So that means it goes through many, many life cycles in one season. So um, now I'm gonna show you guys some pictures for the powdery mildew asexual stage. So here's a germinating conidia, asexual spore. And this can be really awesome to look at under the microscope. You literally can watch these uh, germ tubes grow. And then we have a conidia spore. So this is just one of those chains of spores. And then here we have a picture of a, a mass of conidia pores. And I know that White Knight here said that they're not that interested in powdery mildew, but come on now, that's a pretty beautiful picture right there. <laughs> and then here we have um, powdery mildew just growing on the tip of the leaf. Uh, this is just seen in the good eye. And, uh, Midnight says, I love to learn about it as a gardener. It comes back every year at my country and it's hard to get rid of. Yes, it's almost impossible to get rid of. And it comes back every year on the same plant. Once you get it, there's not really much you can do to get rid of it. There are some organic and synthetic fungicides that do work pretty well. Um, but yeah, it's a big pain to get rid of. I also like, uh, I tell people that I think it's nice to to water on your plants. Most people say that they like to water from below, but I actually think that helps it spread because when you water from above, it, it hits those conidiophores onto the ground. So now we'll get to the sexual stage. This is my favorite part of the powdery mildew life cycle. So here we have the Chas uh, chasmothecium, this is pretty much what you see with your naked eye. Uh, here's a figure that I took. So if you look on the top, we have these uh, chasmothecium. In the middle, this is what their appendages look like. And the appendages really help them hold on and latch onto the plant. A lot of times they can get tangled into the um, mycelium. No, not, uh, so someone asked, do all plants get powdery mildew? No, not all plants get powdery mildew. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the only the flowering plants get them. So the flowering plants evolved 
somewhat recently, around 100 million years ago, and powdery mildew also evolved around 100 million years ago. And it's hard for some organisms to cross lineages. So like ferns don't get it, conifers don't get it, um, horsetail don't get it. There's a good amount of plants that don't get it. Yeah. And then here, if you look at the lower left, this is a species called Phylactinia. And this species is pretty much unique in that, or this genus is pretty much unique in that it has these bulbous bases at the end of its, um, at the start of its appendages. Uh, this is one of my favorite powdery mildew uh, genera. A lot of really well-known powdery mildew mycologists, they make it so that their email address is their favorite genus. And there's one really uh, well-known mycologist that he took Phylactinia as his genus. So I'm waiting until you know I'm a little bit further in my career and I'm probably gonna take Golovinomyces as my email address. <laughs> So Dylan asked if they attach mechanically or enzymatically. The chasmothecia will usually attach, um, from my understanding, they'll attach mechanically with those appendages. But, but then you'll have the germinating spores. They'll send out enzymes, which help them break down the cuticle. And that's how the hostoria enters. It also has these structures called the pressoria, and those are like pegs. And through trigger pressure, that allows them to uh, penetrate the plant. So then here on the bottom right, uh, we have the appendages and the assai, and you can see how it's split open. And this is just something really cool that I, I wanted to share, that no organism is safe, not even a, a pathogen like powdery mildew. So there are these things called hyperparasites, and these are parasites of parasites. So here's a picture I took. Uh, this was a couple of years ago. And I was like, what is going on here? Uh, this doesn't look like powdery mildew at all. And, I, and I, I ended up sequencing this specimen, and it turned out this is called uh, Apelomyces, and this is a pathogen of powdery mildew. So here you can see this is a canidia for, and from it, uh, this other Ascomycota fungus attached its uh, asexual fruiting body to the tip of the canidia for, and it released hundreds, not thousands, of these little spores. So Sue asked me, is there a specific antifungal that you would recommend for flowering stock? Uh, there's a lot of different fungicides that work. Um, most of the synthetic ones are re work really, really well. Um, I think I'm pronouncing this correctly, but there's this one called Floraprin, and me and a co-author researched it on um, different plants, and we found that it was really successful. If you want to work with organic fungicide, they don't work nearly as well. Um, but Sometimes I notice that a small percentage, like 1% sesame oil concentration that you can make by yourself can work really well, but you'll have to spray it maybe once or twice uh, every week or so, every week to two weeks. And then here's another picture of this pathogen of powdery mildew that was taken at Cornell University. So I think it's called, so someone, I think that it's called fluoroquin or fluoropin. Uh, you can send me an email later and I'll get the, that's the active ingredient, but I'll get the trade name so that you can buy it. But it's a really good synthetic fungicide. Uh, the, so someone else asked, what is the pathogen of the pathogen? It's called ampelomyces. It's sometimes it's used as a biocontrol agent. I'm going to go back to show you guys. Uh, but the issue with this is that it can be pretty host specific to different species of powdery mildew. And a lot of different um, companies try and sell this biological control agent to control all different types of powdery mildew species. And it doesn't work that well. So I found this one on powdery mildew on lupine. And it's the only species that I found this one on so far. But I know it occurs on a lot of other species. 
So how diluted sesame oil? I did a little bit of work with sesame oil for my masters and I found if you get up to like 5%, it can be a little phytotoxic and can stunt your growth of your plant. I would try something like half a percent to 1% and apply that once to twice a week. It did help control the powdery mildew, but I did notice that it stunted the growth a little bit. It's pretty hard to control with synthetic fungicides. My um, recommendation is that you try and find cultivars of your different flowers that are resistant to powdery mildew if you're having trouble with it. Yeah, uh, Dylan says that it looks like chicken to me. It does kind of look like a little chicken leg. I never really noticed that before. So now let's get into the biodiversity and phylogeny of powdery mildew in the Pacific Northwest. So when I started out my PhD, I really wanted to know what was I dealing with? How many powdery mildew species are here? So I went out and I collected over 300 specimens of powdery mildew from the University of Washington campus. And this includes the upper left, University of Washington main campus, the upper right, the Center for Urban Horticulture, and the bottom, the Washington State Arboretum. I was really lucky to work at University of Washington. It's such an amazing campus and we have such a diversity of plants. Um, so CT Rose, when, when, when you say that it worked with specifics is the best for sure way to figure out what works for the mildew is to sequence it out. So that's a good question. A lot of these, um, yeah, all of, a lot of different powdery mildew species need to be controlled in different ways and they show up at different times of the year. So the best time to control them really depends on the species. And that's why taxonom uh, the taxonomic work of powdery mildews is really important. And a lot of plant pathologists uh, are also taxonomists and work a lot with phylogeny. So back to my collection of the powdery mildews. So I collected over 300 specimens and around what I found here is that there were around 75 different species. Um, and of the, of those 30 had never been reported in the United States. So they were invasive species. So, uh, Kitty Ness said as a master gardener, we only recommend research based remedies. What did you say was a research-based remedy for powdery mildew? Uh, Kitty, you make an excellent point in that I like to say that a lot of with a lot of these organic remedies, there's a lot of snake oil out there. And there are a lot of them aren't peer-reviewed, so it's hard to know what actually works. But I actually wrote two peer-reviewed papers that evaluates different products for control of powdery mildew. And I'd be happy to send that to you afterwards if you send me an email. Both were just recently published. Um, and we go over a lot of different techniques and we go over some um, products that claim to control powdery mildew that definitely do not. So just email me afterwards. So of, of these 75 different species I found, 15 were undescribed new species. And this is just goes back to what I was saying that not really anyone's doing work on powdery mildews. For example, just at the University of Washington campus, I found 15 species that were new to science. Uh, oh, Nath, I'll give you guys my email at the end of the presentation. I'll write it on my PowerPoint. Uh, someone asked your email. No, I uh, Will Bo said, are you familiar with the Epstein lab at UCD plant pathology? I work there on fungicide resistance powdery mildew on melons. No, I, I haven't heard of them, but that sounds really interesting, like really interesting work. I'll definitely check them out after uh, my presentation. So now I just wanna show you guys some of the diversity that I saw just on the University of Washington campus. Here's a bunch of the different species that I uh, found. These are the canidia. So just to give you guys a little bit of a reference, canidia are around uh, 30 micrometers in length. And this is about roughly the same thickness of your hair. Um, and here you can see that there's all different shapes. So we have round ones, we have 
obovate, we have ovate. Some of them have little nodules on the end. Uh, some of them are a little bit rectangular and they range in size. And most specifically, they range in their length to width ratio. So Amanda asked, are there different species of powdery mildew visible by the human eye or only under a microscope? That's a really great question. Uh, when I started out, I would have told you that they were only visible uh, under the microscope. But now that I'm really noticing powdery mildew everywhere, you can actually see, tell the difference between species based on uh, the colony sizes, how thick they are. Uh, there's some other hints, but you need to be pretty experienced to be able to tell the difference of species based on uh, the naked eye. So here we have some variety in the canidia force. So here they range in their sizes. They also range in the amount of spores that the, are in the chain. Some other ways that they vary are there's some that actually spiral. I've never seen one of these in the Pacific Northwest, but I see pictures. I dream of the day that I'll find one. Uh, there's also some species that are endoph endophytic, which means that they are inside the plant and they'll come out of these little holes in the plant called stomata, which allow the plant to breathe. So now the chasmothecia, these are the coolest part of the powdery mildew. It's kind of like, a, I always say it's like a sci-fi movie. Here we have the chasmothecia following the veins of the plant. I notice this a lot of times it follows the veins of the plant. And this is because that's where a lot of the nutrients and water requirement are within the plant. Uh, here's our good old friend from before, phylactinia. Uh, you can see those bulbous bases at the start of the um, appendages. Also, the appendages here are like little spheres. And then when you look on the right, you can see all the different acai. And the acai here, they range from one to two ascospores per ascus. And then we have uh, chasmothecia of uh, an earsophase species. And here, if you look at the appendages, we saw these a little bit earlier. They're very branched at the end. Also, you can see on the, the acai on the bottom of the screen, and they range between six and eight ascospores per ascus. And this is just uh, an awesome picture. This is a scanning electron microscope picture of a chasmothecium. Um, in this picture here, what the scanning electron microscope really shows is all the texture on the surface of the chasmothecium. And here you can see how the appendages are really intertwined with the mycelium. Here's Chasmothecia potosphera spirea on Aruncus dioecious. Uh, what's interesting about this one are two things. One, look how long the appendages can be on figure C. And then if you look at D and G, the appendages are actually segment, seg segmented. Jonathan asked, when I was in Berlin last year, there was so much powdery mildew on maple trees that I was scared about bringing it home. Is there fear of global transmission of powdery mildew changing our forests as we know them? That's a great question, Jonathan, and that actually has to do a little bit with my research, what I'm going to get to a, a little later. Um, powdery mildew is really common in Germany. One of the main researchers of powdery mildew uh, is a German mycologist known as Dr. Uwe Braun, and he wrote the textbook on powdery mildews. So here's some more variation that we're looking at. This is uh, Chasmothecia of Gallovinomyces. Uh, if you look upper left, here we have around 40 appendages on one Chasmothecia. Also, if you look at the uh, acai, we have around two spores per ascus. Also, if you've been noticing, the acai shape changes a lot species to species. Here again, we have a, a new species that I discovered on lupinus. This is one that I have not described yet. 
Uh, it takes a lot of work to describe a new species, which I'll get to in a little bit. Uh, but this also has many appendages per chasmothecia. So here's the chasmothecia of Sawadia bicordis and Sawadia tuasnia. Uh, these are powdery mildew on maple trees. This is probably uh, what was affecting the maples in Berlin. I can almost guarantee it. So now that you guys have seen a lot of the diversity of powdery mildews uh, that I saw in the Pacific Northwest, and you have a little bit of an understanding of what powdery mildew is, I'm gonna just go over a couple of the objectives for my research. I don't wanna uh, bore you guys too much with my research, so I just picked three objectives. The first objective was titled Phylogeny and Taxonomy of Powdery Mildew on Foreless Species. The second objective was titled Phylogeny and Taxonomy of Powdery Mildew on Viburnum Species. And the third objective was titled An Evaluation of an Ecologically Detrimental Powdery Mildew Species. So in my preliminary research where I collected all those powdery mildew species, so if I want to describe a new species, you have to do a worldwide an analysis of powdery mildew if you want to get published in a reputable journal. So for this first objective, uh, Corliss is native to uh, a lot of the northern hemisphere, specifically uh, northern North America and uh, Japan. So C.T. Ross asked, are the species of powdery mildew so varied to fit the diversity of hosts that they can take on? That's a very good question. Um, it seems that they have evolved these different morphological mechanisms that give them the highest fitness so that allow them to survive and proliferate the best depending on their host. So I can't remember exactly, um, but there are different advantages to the different structures of appendages that relate to their hosts. But uh, I'll have to check on that if you want to email me later and I'll, I'll find a for sure answer. So back to describing a new species, there's two things that you have to do if you want to describe a new, or there's, there's three things. You need to do a worldwide analysis and you need to look at all the different species of powdery mildew that affect that host. You want to know the host range and you have to do a morphological analysis to see what the morphological differences are between the different species. Here you can see, um, this is a new species I described. On the left, you can see the chasmothecia. And on the right, you can see the asexual stages. So the third thing that you need to do is you need to do a genetic analysis. So on the right, here's a phylogenetic tree that I made of powdery mildew on Corliss caused by hirsophase species. So I, I just wanted to mention before I go any further, there's a lot of plants that can have multiple different species of powdery mildew on the same plant. Corliss is one of them. So phylactinia and hirsophase both affect Corliss plants. So what I was doing was I was looking at just the hirsophase species. So I see that you guys can't see yeah. the right to, you can't see the slide. Can you guys not yeah. see the uh, That's true, they the tree? I'm, I'm having some issues. Or what are you not able to see right now? Just bear with us for a second. We're just working through a little bit of some kinks. Okay, I think I have uh, your screen up now. I hope they can see it. Let's see what I can see in YouTube. It's coming. It's coming. Give it a second. I think it's coming. Oh, it looks like something's happening. Yes, we're in. Great. <laughs> so uh, Sorry. back to describing a new species. So we need to do genetic analysis. And over on the right, I created a phylogenetic tree of all powdery mildew on Corliss species. And here, each one of these names represents a specimen and sequence data of a specimen. 
So I had sequenced two different regions of DNA to create this tree. And I was able to describe four new species. So A, this is Irsafe pseudocorlea seriarum on Corlis seboldiana. Now this plant, this species of powdery mildew is native to Japan. Um, we named it Irsafe pseudocorlea serum because it's very similar to that species ahead, uh, right above it, Irsafe corlea serum. So we just put pseudo in front of it. A lot of times, Nowadays, when we name powdery mildew species, I always do this. I name it after the host plant or the host genus that it's found on. So then if you look at B, this is a new species, Irsafe cornutiae on Corlis cornuta. Uh, Corlis cornuta is a native plant to the Pacific Northwest. It's a hazelnut. And then below that, you'll see C, Irsafe corali americana, and this is uh, powdery mildew that's host specific on Corlis americana. So Kitty Ness asked, how do you do your sequencing? We have a shared genomic lab at the University of Washington School of Forestry, and we all do our sequencing there. Basically, we have there's a few steps that we have to take. Um, one, we need to extract the DNA from the from the cell wall of the, of the fungus. Once we do that and we have this um, mass of just DNA, then we run PCR. So this is basically just making millions, if not billions of copies of this DNA. And then we um, send it off for sequencing in this process that's called Sanger sequencing. Um, I'm not gonna go into too much details of that. Yeah, Leah. Corliss equals hazelnut. Uh, so back to C, this new species on Corliss americana. This species is from uh, the northeast. And then the last species, D, was the fourth new species we described here. And this was on Austria virginiana. And this was native to also the northeast and Canada. So then for my second objective, uh, it was very similar to the first one. So I wanted to describe a new species of powdery mildew on viburnum species. And for this, I did another worldwide analysis. Uh, and for this one, I worked with researchers from Germany, Russia, China, Japan, Korea. And I might be forgetting someone. But I just love doing these experiments and uh, this work. One, I love powdery mildew, and two, it's so fun working with all these different um, researchers from all around the world. So Shannon asked, have you looked at powdery mildew on Cordylus avalana in truffle orchards in the Pacific Northwest? Also powdery mildew on Quercus rober, host trees in truffle orchards in the Pacific Northwest? So, Shannon, that's a very good question. Yes, I've looked on it on Corliss avelina. So I'm going to go back to the slide before. If you see Irsafe corlea sierra, that one is a pretty bad powdery mildew on Corliss avelina, but we don't have that in the Pacific Northwest. So hopefully no one's bringing plants from China over and are going to bring that powdery mildew here. We do get phylactinia on Corliss avelina here, and that uh, can be a problem. I haven't really done much work on phylactinia species on Corliss though. Joseph asked, which regions do you sequence? So I sequence the ITS region. It's a common barcode for a uh, marker for fungi. And then I also sequence the adjacent 28S region. Sequencing powdery mildew and plant pathogens can be very difficult because it's often intermingled with a lot of other organisms of fungi. Um, but I actually just wrote a paper on a protocol that allows us to sequence the ITS and 28S region of specimens up to 150 years old. So uh, Shannon, I think you asked which one. I think you're referring to which species of powdery mildew. If you look at uh, 
group A there, right above that, uh, one, two, three, four specimens above that, it says Irsafeg coriliacearum on Coralis avalana. So that's the Irsafeg species that affects Coralis avalana. Jonathan asks, is powdery mildew a strict parasitic relationship and how does it interact or benefit from the plant? When there are multiple powdery mildew on the same plant, how do they interact with each other? Jonathan, this is a great question. Uh, I don't know exactly. My hypothesis is that they are competing with each other. Um, I'm actually, I have a, I, I'm graduating in June and I received a job with the USDA and we're looking at uh, penicillium on apples and we're seeing if, if some penicillium species that don't do that much damage to the apples can be used to compete with the penicillium that does do damage to the apples. So back to the phylogeny and taxonomy of powdery mildew on viburnum species. So we, I did the worldwide analysis with, with researchers from throughout the world. And then we conducted morphological analysis. And the taxonomy is really, it's, it's somewhat of an art form. And I believe that uh, the artwork behind taxonomy is starting to um, we're starting to lose that because of how, how much people can you are using their microscope cameras. But for this paper, I tried to uh, include artwork. So on the left, this was uh, the powdery mildew expert I mentioned before, Dr. Uva Braun. He's a great artist, and he drew this chasmothecium of this new species. And in the middle here, one of the gardeners that I work with, Anastasia Sauer, she is a, a great botanic botanical illustrator or scientific illustrator, and she drew the asexual form of this fungus for me. So then after we did the morphological analyses, we needed to do genetic analyses. So here we have a phylogenetic tree of Irsafe on viburnum. So if you look at A, these are species from Russia, South Korea, and China. Before my research, we only knew that this was in South Korea, but now we know that this species is also in Russia and China. And then if you look at B, this used to be two separate species, but based on this genetic and um, morphological analysis, we were able to reduce these to synonymy and reduce these two species, which were Irsafe viburnii, and Irsafe pedwigii into one species, Irsafe viburnii. We took the name Irsafe viburnii because that was introduced in the literature first. So Irsafe pedwigii is no longer with us. Uh, then C, we have Irsafe pseudoviburnii. This is a species from South Korea and Japan, very closely related to Irsafe viburnii. And then D, we described a new species, which I, I found in the United States. Uh, this is Irsafe viburnophila on viburnum tinus. But we also found out later that this species is also located in Switzerland and is most likely native to Europe, not the USA. We found out that it would, we determined that it was most likely native to Europe because um, it doesn't form its sexual structure here in the USA, but it does in Europe. So then the last objective I'm gonna discuss with you guys is an evaluation of an ecologically detrimental powdery mildew species. Uh, so this goes back to, I forget who mentioned a question about this. Um, someone talked about powdery mildew in Berlin. So big leaf maple is a really eco ecologically, economically and culturally important native deciduous tree to our area. Uh, it's, you, it's one of the only hardwood species that's economically important. We use it for furniture. And we also, as of recently, it's used as a sustainable source of maple syrup. I haven't tried it yet, but I hear it's really delicious. Um, but recently, the Forest Service is, is reporting that there's a great decline in big leaf maples in the Pacific Northwest. 
And I'm in the Tobin lab at the University of Washington. And we've done a little bit of research of why this decline is happening. And what I noticed in my collection in 2018 is that there's an invasive fungal pathogen, uh, Cywodia bicornis, on big leaf maples. This had never been reported before. It may have been reported in the past, but reported as a different species. But my sequence data showed that this was the first report of this species in the United States on big leaf maples. And I noticed that powdery mildew was on all these plants. It was everywhere. So I just did a quick survey at the University of Washington campus. And if you look on the upper right right now, um, these are all the different big leaf maples on the University of Washington campus. There's 519 of them. And of those 519, 518 were infected with powdery mildew. And I, I looked at the average coverage of the plant and the average coverage was 90%. So this picture that I'm showing you with all this white on it, that's all powdery mildew. And this is the normal. This isn't an outlier that was really infected. This is what most trees on the University of Washington campus look like. So Joseph asked, are you using irsafate glycine as your outgroup? I can't remember what we used. Yeah, irsafate gly glycine is our outgroup on this uh, allogenetic tree. I know, it was, it's hard to believe that one big leaf so Emily asked only one big, big leaf maple didn't have it. And I, I know it's hard to believe that big leaf maple, that one plant didn't have it, but I swear it. I saw it with my own eyes. There was one plant without powdery mildew on it. It was very small though. Dylan asked, does the infection deter nutrient uptake or photosynthesis? So as you can imagine, it greatly inhibits photosynthesis. It covers the chlorophyll of the plant, which is used in photosynthesis. Um, also, powdery mildew takes the nutrients from the plant. Ginny asked, does it affect any other maples? And I'll get, I'll get to this in, on my next slide. So, what I did now was I wanted to know where did this powdery mildew on big leaf maples come from? If it's, it's not native to here, how did it get here? Where did it come from and when did it get here? So what I did was I got specimens from throughout the world. I have around 40 specimens from Germany, 10 specimens from New Zealand. Um, around, I collected around 100 from Washington State, Canada, California, and Oregon. And we found that there are three different haplotypes or strains of powdery mildew on maples. So if you notice, all three of these strains are located in Europe, and only one of these strains, strain three, is located in North America, New Zealand, and China. And what this is telling me is that we have this high diversity in Europe, so it's most likely native to Europe. And then we're getting this bottleneck effect where strain three is a very um, detrimental strain, and it came to North America, New Zealand, and China. So I wanted to know how detrimental is this strain three? So I took this strain three from big leaf maple, and I inoculated 10 different species of maple trees to see how each tree was able to defend itself. Uh, these are all seedlings. I grew around 20 of each different species of maple. And if what you can notice here is that big leaf maple is by far the most susceptible to this powdery mildew. So far, I haven't been able to figure out when exactly, what year this powdery mildew came to the United States, but that can be up to future researchers. So just thank you guys all for uh, listening to my presentation. I'm going to write my email address down at the bottom of this acknowledgement section so that um, you guys can email me with any future questions. Or if you have any questions now, please let me know. So Rob asks, is powdery mildew more prevalent in the spring? Does it stay there all year? 
So powdery mildew is definitely more prevalent in the fall. So you get the first uh, germinations in the spring. And when you get that first germ germination, it's very important that you apply your control methods right away. So those, when I did my, um, my overview of powdery mildew on maple trees, I um, looked at them in October when the disease was most severe. So let me just write my uh, email address if you guys think of any questions for later. Thank you guys. Thank you guys. It was fun. Hopefully uh, we'll be able to get these going in person again soon. Yes, I agree. I hope so. He can't hear me. And uh, I feel like the Oregon Mycological Society, I, I can't wait to go uh, reschedule our, our Thai food dinner sometime. Oh, yeah, that would be great. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you all for joining us. We'll see you next month, unless we are free by then. All right, thank you guys. Have you done any work on Leviola? Uh, so Ginny asks, have you done any work on Leviola? That's a really good question. That's actually one of those endophytic species where it's inside the leaf and it comes out through the stomata. And no, I haven't seen those in the Pacific Northwest yet. All right, so any more questions? Thanks, Kim. Yeah, I, uh, Kim said, Michael, we owe you more than Thai. Maybe a great mushroom meal. Please. Morels. Tell me all your morel spots. <laughs> You're most welcome. It was great to have you. This is a great learning experience. In Europe, do the big leaf maples die from powdery mildew? Uh, no, they do not, from my understanding. Um, the big leaf maples here, it's not really clear if it's the powdery mildew that's causing their decline. Uh, still a lot more research needs to be done. But this is a really big problem right now, in my opinion. Jason asked, do you see it in the rainforest? There are some tropical species of powdery mildew. So Leah asked, what are major differences between rust and powdery mildew? Oh, that's a great question. I'm actually starting to uh, jump into the rust world. Rusts are really beautiful and they interest me a lot. They're actually very different. Rusts have a very, very complex life cycle. Um, they often have alternate hosts. So this is like pretty mind blowing. They complete half of their life cycle on one host and half of their life cycle on another. And they're also in the Basidio Mycota. So they're in all, a totally different lineage than the powdery mildews. Any more questions? Well, I guess I will stop the stream then. Thanks again for joining us. Oh, looks like we got one. So Dylan asks, in reference to natives, is there an enzymatic defense that native pathogens are invasive spreading at an exponential rate? 
So the, the issue here is that the native pathogens with their native plants, they co-evolve together. So you call this a co-evolutionary arms race. So as the native pathogens or the native to the host, as they evolved increase pathogenicity, the plants over millions of years evolved ways to defend themselves. But when you will get an invasive powdery mildew species and you bring it into an ecosystem where these plants have not evolved defenses against it, that's when you get these really um, detrimental um, disease severity incidences. So that's a really good question. We do a lot of research on our, in my lab, in what we call evolutionary naive hosts. <laughs> Twin legs. Jonathan asked, are there certain temperatures and humidities and airflow rates where powdery mildew cannot spread, for example, in cannabis greenhouses? My understanding is that with the, the work, little work I've done on this is that it usually does a little bit better in high temperatures, but once you get too high temperatures, I think if I'm remembering correctly, it's like above 90 degrees, it can be pretty lethal to the powdery mildew. But yes, powdery mildew loves greenhouses. I do my research in greenhouses and uh, I water my plants from below and it's pretty easy for me to inoculate the plants and just get powdery mildew all throughout the greenhouse. It's a beautiful thing for me. All right, so that seems like that's it for the questions. Uh, thank you guys for tuning in, and thanks Oregon Mycological Society for having me. I'm going to check out now. Great. Thank you so much. And uh, transition back into the other screen. And let's see. Oh, we still have some more questions. Is it worth buying mildew-resistant plants, or will they still get it? Uh, it depends. Most plants that are can be advertised as mildew resistant they won't be a hundred percent resistant but it's definitely a better option so Oregon Mycological Society asked is powdery mildew similar to mildew and clothes I actually don't really know what mildew and clothes are um, I think that it's I can't imagine that it's similar at all as powdery mildew just grows on plants, it's a plant pathogen, and um, I'm not sure what mildew, I'm just not, not really sure what mildew and clothes are, to be honest. Oregon Mycological Society asks, is powdery mildew sensitive to heat? Uh, yeah, high, very high temperatures can be lethal to powdery mildew. I, I think that it's above nine, I remember, uh, seeing something that above 90 degrees, it's pretty lethal. So Anthony said, is there a good resource for treating powdery mildew on grapevines? Uh, yes, there are some great systemic fungicides that work very well on grapevines. Um, I'm blanking on the name right now, but they, I'm pretty sure the, the name it has grape in them. Uh, they're very toxic, but they do a really great job. I can look that up later for you if you want to email me. Do you have a photography setup for powdery mildews? Uh, yeah, we have a great setup in my lab. We have three microscopes and we have a little puck camera. And it just looks like a little puck. You screw it onto the microscope and it takes beautiful pictures. 
it just costs around five thousand dollars. <laughs> And all the microscopes connect right up to the computer. So we have a workstation just for using the microscopes. I know when I leave uh, my lab here, I'm definitely going to miss the microscope setup. But I'm pretty sure at the next lab when we're working out, we're going to have a really cool setup too. So Stellar asks, oh my, is it worth it to take macroscopic images as well? Yeah, I like to take them. Uh, usually when I make my figures, I'll have one picture just with the naked eye, and then I'll have a bunch of pictures under the microscope. I think it's just a cool addition. Uh, not really needed to describe new species, though. Any more questions? So Ginny asks, have you found a lot of Chasmothecia in the Pacific Northwest? Mild temps here. Yeah, that's a great question. I actually think that our, our climate is pretty great for powdery mildews because I noticed that we get a lot, we, we get a lot of species that do form Chasmothecia, Chasmothecia, and we get a lot of species that don't. So it does get, the, the temperature is pretty perfect for, 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 for forming Chasmothecia. All right, thank you guys. I'm checking out. We will see you in the next meeting. Thank you so much for joining us. Bye.